I'm Najar Abdul Musawir, artist, educator, and art activist. And I am like to share my current research on the banjo with all of you. This idea of reconstruction to recontextualize uh, ideas. And this ideas that I'm approaching in the banjo is the history. The banjo has relationship with Africa. Most people think that it's a southern hibbly instrument, but it's not. It was an instrument made by the slaves and it's the, ch it's the child of African string instruments. I created some very large pieces, four particular large pieces in this exhibition amongst other pieces that's in the show. And I have behind me right now the first idea of instrument coming from Africa to America over the Atlantic Ocean. And so this beautiful blues and this the pieces of burlap moving across the surface is showing the movement of the water. But yet this particular instrument, this particular collage wood piece is actually the ship coming to America or the spirit of the banjo coming to America. And so I found myself wanting to really explore this idea in a way that it would not just be about the banjo in America, but the banjo and its relationship to Africa, and then what happened to the banjo after the emancipation. Why did not the banjo go north with slaves? Why did it not become an instrument of black culture or Negro culture, if I may, in America? Here we have in this other piece, which is part of the, actually what I should have said earlier, is that it's part of this banjo series. And this piece is dealing with the idea of the plantation. Once the uh, Africans were put into slavery in America and on the plantation, some of the uh, slaves began making these interesting instruments, these objects that they would play on the plantation. Uh, actually, according to what I've read, that the slave owners didn't wasn't overly concerned about the strings as much as they was with drums. Drums, they had a serious problem because they knew that they used them as forms of communication, but the banjo or the string instrument, they allowed them to use it at weddings and other activities and so forth. And it's interesting because during that period, some of the poor whites who either was maybe working on the plantation as well, getting paid to work on the plantation, or just lived in the area, were actually was interested in the string instruments and they actually played it together. Actually, the slaves actually taught some of those individuals, whites, how to play this banjo. And it was also interesting is that Thomas Jefferson, in his writings, which is common knowledge now, stated that the great, one of the greatest contributions made by Africans is the banjo. I found that to be very interesting because as we look at the, uh, this period of American history, they did not allow us to keep our names. They didn't allow us to keep none of the traditions, nor wear the clothing or anything associated with Africa. But yet, this particular instrument survived. One of the things I found very interesting in working on this particular project was that I saw a program called a Detective History, if I'm correct. And as a result, they had a series, a series or a program that talked about the banjo, that someone had a banjo that they believed that was made during slavery, and they wanted to know was it authentic. What I found interesting is that when I looked at this particular piece, it reminded me of the, of the pieces that I was working on, that for some reason, I chose to use all types of woods, all kinds of raw material. There's, that, there's no hierarchy in the material. And as a result, it, that program made me look at it even closer. And then when I went to the Smithsonian, which I did my sabbatical at the Smithsonian for over two months, and so as a result, I discovered that there was a struggle for the banjo to continue to exist in its original state, meaning that the, there were companies that actually started making banjos, creating banjos, started marketing banjos, but in their marketing, they made a statement, and I quote, this is not the crude and unelevated an unsophisticated instrument, the African banjo. And they even drew cartoons, characters, of these nice bow-tied banjos walking, saying that we have elevated the banjo. And as a result of elevating the banjo, we have made the banjo more important and more valuable than it ever had been. And so, many of the Africans who were enslaved after the emancipation, who went north, did not take the banjo with them because they didn't see the banjo as a serious instrument. They, they, they had bought into, at least I believe, they might have bought into this idea of it not being an elevated instrument. 
And as a result, when they got it north, they grabbed hold of the guitar because they wanted to play a string instrument. And then we know the rest of the story for most of us. But I really believe that this idea of marketing, this whole struggle of deconstructing and the banjo to something that's become no longer as part of the African history in America that Jefferson talked about, but becoming more part of Western culture or white culture. Another example is Henry Swatana, African American artist, 1893, created a painting called The Banjo Lesson. That same year, 1893, Mary Catset created a uh, drawing and painting of called The Banjo Lesson of a young uh, white girl and an older white woman, well-dressed, and Henry Russell Tanner's contrasting older man, young boy, and he's in a, more of the southern type of attire, not wealthy. But these two, Im these two images that I noticed was very interesting because Tanner was responding to his culture and how the banjo been played in the African-American culture. But Mar Mary Catlett images reflected the marketing strategies that was being, uh, being set forth by these companies of elevating it amongst the elite. In this piece behind me, it's relating to after slavery, more moving toward the 21st century. We are now standing in the light, standing in the sun. And so we, not more people are knowledgeable about the history of the banjo and its relationship to Africa. And what I find interesting is when I look at a group called the Chocolate, it was Carolina Chocolate Drops, who performed throughout the United States and won awards for their music, but had played the banjo and as a elevated instrument. And these individuals had been what you call formally trained in, 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 in musical instruments, in classical music and so forth. And so, but if you look at Steve, people, well, uh, entertainers like Steve Martin, and many others who have really embraced the banjo and the history along with it. And it really makes me feel good to be a part of this idea of reconstructing this wood and reconstructing this idea and recontextualizing it in a way that can make it more appreciated, more valued. When we look at this work, we're looking at small pieces of wood that had to have been abandoned. All this put together to create these interesting forms. I looked at the banjo not only in terms of looking back at, at history where you may see most writers make reference to the Korah as being the mother of the banjo, but the Zalam or the Nia Titi or uh, some of the other uh, instruments, African string instruments, look more like the banjo than the Korah. You also may see some of the influence and aesthetic of African mass and, see, and so forth. You also see African textiles. So I'm using the African uh, art form within the work aesthetically to bring about these different uh, ideas of the banjo on, African, I mean, on American soil. Hey, 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 hey,